people, six people from Hellenic Open University, uh, but we express our uh, personal opinions mostly. We don't represent the management of the university. None of us, actually, I would say, represents the management here. Yeah. So whatever you hear is not what is cannot be considered to be the university's official position. Let's let's make it clear. Yeah. No. No. It's important that you that you mentioned that. But uh, we will not make uh, a report on this further. Uh, we, will, we will share the expertise with you of the the, the slides and the. Um, but um, uh, we only work with, with, with formal statements. Yeah. But it's uh, really already enriching what we hear, how you, um, how you have been, been uh, working in this, uh, in, in relation to the COVID and the positioning of, of Hellenic. It's, uh, for us, it's really enriching to hear how the members are uh, positioned in the country and how they operate in this. Um, in this. And then make these comparisons or mapping what everybody's doing within the, uh, the task forces and the special interest groups. Um, okay, uh, quality assurance. Um, I have my slides on uh, on e accents. I don't know if you all are familiar with, with the accents because uh, Atlantic has e accents label um, uh, on nine programs, and the e accents label was. Um, gained uh, two times, one in, uh, uh, let's say, up to 2012 or 15, I don't know, by heart. And the, the others are um, uh, still valid, uh, valid until 2021, up to 2020. Um, let me just uh, show you some of the, of the slides I have on, on, on this. Um, so. I hope you can see it. Uh, so this is the e excellence label, associate in quality. That is uh, how we call the, um, uh, the universities that have this, uh, this label. Um, like I said, Atlantic has this connected to nine uh, programs up till uh, 2021. And the principle behind this is that we um, uh, have a tool developed that um, uh, assesses your uh, before we call it e-learning performance, your online performance, your quality in online teaching on 35 benchmarks. And these 35 benchmarks are linked to these chapters, curriculum design, course design, delivery, services, and management. Uh, altogether, these are 35 benchmarks. And uh, they're building on the three main pillars of ease of access, interaction, flexibility, and personalization. We are not looking into the content of the program. It's all about the... Um, uh, the delivery, so to say. We have done this in a benchmarking approach because we didn't want to have a standard, a European standard uh, for all universities to live up to. It's more an improvement instrument, an enhancement instrument, where you can measure your current performance and uh, your vision of um, growth, uh, making a roadmap to, um, to envisage uh, next steps of improvement. It's building on the principle that the institution is taking responsibility of QA. It's based on self-assessment uh, with peer reviews. And actually, the, the collaborative process of dialogue and discussing the benchmarks with your colleagues is the, is the, the strength of the instrument. It's, uh, the 35 benchmarks give you the opportunity to not miss out on any elements that is related to online education and offering you with a description of each benchmark the, the basis of a dialogue with your colleagues, uh, even with different, um, uh, from different departments, uh, on, and, uh, uh, to feed the discussion if it is adequate or not adequate, um, how uh, your university is delivering to that specific benchmark. Uh, in the meantime, you can also compare with what other universities do because there are references in the manual of the excellence to uh, how other universities live up to these benchmarks. In the end, uh, the discussion leads to a roadmap of improvement. Um, yeah, and then, uh, so it, it guides you in developing uh, e-learning programs. It, uh, there's also a guide for internal discussion. It uh, indicates the improvement of quality. You can learn from other, uh, other institutions that represent good practices and is up to date on, um, on e-learning development. So this is the, the manual. We are up for an update because it's already um, some years 
ago that we have uh, published this one. It is, of course, uh, already always a big effort to do so. Um, you cannot get a, a project funding specifically for updating uh, this. So we, we are very much relying on the experts that are connected to the excellence and the time they are available to, um, to support this. It's open, uh, open uh, source available and um, we have already many universities uh, using that. I'll come to that later. In the end, uh, all who have this um, uh, label have also the possibility to, uh, to be part of this community of exchanging expertise per benchmark. So if you are um, having a task of improving on, on a certain benchmark, you can all also rely on the community of other Jacksons uh, label owners to, uh, to share expertise on, on that uh, field. The institutions involved in uh, keeping the uh, developing the Accents tool as well as keeping it up to date are the, these first uh, six mentioned here. Uh, they form uh, the backbone of, um, uh, of the Excellence. And then uh, we have a whole list of universities that used it up to um, um, uh, 37. Uh, I think we, we could update it up to 50, 50 uh, universities that have used the instrument uh, by now. And then we have also shared the instrument with uh, European and global stakeholders. We shared it with the African Council for Distant Education, Calet Latin America, UNESCO. We, we had several sessions with, with UNESCO in, in Paris on the excellence. Uh, actually, we are talking with ICDE now of using the e excellence globally. Um, and yeah, we have uh, also worked with INCWA. Uh, in the past years, we, we worked with INCWA because ENQA had a, um, uh, a working group on quality in online education. And uh, this was led by Aki, the, um, the one from uh, Catalonia. And the result of this working group by ENQA was a, was a paper on quality in online education. And it contains only references to the excellence. It's actually fully building on our, on our instrument. And we have uh, therefore also very good relationships with ENQA and their quality agencies, which is important because um, uh, to, um, uh, how do you call that, to work together with your quality uh, agency on QA and online education, you have to understand how the system works. It's not just ticking boxes or, uh, based on the, um, on the QA system that they're using for conventional universities because uh, that doesn't match with our members of open universities. How they provide um, the same quality with alternative methods uh, is difficult to capture in a system of tick boxes. You have to be in dialogue with your QA agencies for them to understand how you, how you do that. And, um, and therefore this, this working group uh, very much uses our benchmarks and promotes the dialogue of the QA agencies with the universities that um, uh, provide online and distance uh, education. So we have, we have done some work of, of awareness also to the ENQA and the ENQA members on um, how to deal with, um, with the open universities. Um, for us, it, it would be interesting to know how at this moment um, uh, quality assurance is um, uh, covered, captured in, your, in Hellenic further, and how you uh, connect with the Hellenic Quality Assurance Agency being um, different from the conventional universities. Uh, George, can I take the floor for a minute? Because uh, I, I, I am, uh, you know, I've been appointed in my, my, my school uh, to sit on the board of uh, the universities committee that uh, uh, oversees uh, quality assurance. Now, uh, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, Professor Estathopoulos, has also been notified about this meeting. I can't see him right now, but he's in charge of uh, that nominally. Now, we had uh, an uh, evaluation exercised by an external committee two weeks ago. And uh, right now, uh, Hellenic universities are, uh, let's say, evaluated uh, in, a, in, a, in a series of uh, steps. Uh, at the very first step, they need to, let's say, 
take a certificate for the way they manage quality assurance. So you first get to validate the process, and then uh, they get to validate, uh, let's say, procedures, uh, departments, or uh, study programs. So I expect that we have cleared the first one, but the idea is that uh, uh, the very first level for every university has to be how do you manage quality assessment. I think that, uh, uh, and Nikos Karousos, who is also attending this meeting, will probably give you some uh, history on how we collect data. Uh, as of inception, the Hellenic Honorary University did uh, uh, collect data on, uh, let's say, at the student level and at the tutor level about how the whole educational experience has been run. So that's something that we score pretty strongly, uh, you know, since inception. That's a part that has been followed up by other Greek universities. So th that's the, 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 first, uh, the first point. The other point, however, is that uh, it's been, as I understand it, quite a painstaking experience to discuss with Hellenic uh, high quality, Higher Education Quality Assurance uh, Agency because uh, we are just one university that works that way and the rest of them are conventional, which means that the way that the agency is uh, administering its procedures and its guidelines is very heavily biased towards uh, how other universities are conducting business. So that's been quite a, 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 a difficult partnership, I would put it that way. Yeah. So, uh, so I would imagine that our uh, university, I, I personally would have liked to see our agency being, let's say, influenced by, let's say, a more uh, uh, higher umbrella uh, organization like ADPU and that one. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, my point. Yeah. Uh, the thing that, that is what we actually hope to achieve, and then it's up to um, up to the quality agencies and and how they connect with Enqua to take up the guidelines for, from Enqua. And actually, the, this working group gave guidelines to the um, to the quality agencies on how to handle um, universities uh, that are predominantly uh, offer online education. So I hope that the Atlantic um, quality agency uh, would have have uh, followed that and and considered that. What we have seen uh, overall from our open universities and the quality issues is that they do not want to have a separate or different system because then people are doubting the, the quality. They want to be measured by the by the running system, the current system that is used for conventional systems as well, uh, conventional universities as well. Uh, but they, they need room for dialogue to explain how they live up to the criteria differently than conventional universities. And this dialogue is very important, and therefore the benchmarks are also very, very helpful. So, um, yeah, it's a bit, uh, some uh, universities uh, show that they have the, the accent quality label. I don't know uh, if that was done also two weeks ago when you had the evaluation, but because Hellenic has this uh, quality label and they should, they should know about this, this Hellenic quality agency, what, what, that, what that means, um, actually. Yeah. Well, I can remember that the VCE excellence, uh, uh, let's say, our uh, uh, usage of that label, I can remember it being invoked during the assessment exercise. So, uh, and we scored some points on that one. But the thing is that uh, bringing that up with the national agency is not a straightforward thing. No, no, I understand. Yeah. In the meantime, I welcome Alessandra here. She's uh, a colleague of, of mine. Uh, so if you are wondering, uh, who joined? It's uh, our colleague Alessandra Antonacci. Yeah. Uh, no. I, I also have a, a presentation of how uh, quality assurance is organized within the um, Hellenic Open University. If you would like me to share it. Yes, please do. Yeah. There's actually one slide, um, though, but uh, it facilitates the discussion, I think. So. Uh, I think you can see that uh, we have presented that uh, during uh, a webinar on um, uh, this issue. I think uh, that was organized by ADPU. And uh, the um, overall organization is actually shown in uh, this um, uh, figure where um, the Hellenic Open University was the first uh, that uh, was uh, by law. In, uh, 
had to institute the two dependent units and Nikos is uh, uh, now responsible for the second one. And uh, I was for the e content, uh, educational content methodology and technology laboratory. Uh, so we operate two independent units as well as the interface to the national um, instrument for uh, quality assurance of all universities. So uh, what we actually do inside the Hellenic Open University is that uh, the um, educational common con content and methodology and technology laboratory uh, is responsible for certifying uh, the educational content and methodologies used for the delivering uh, distance education and uh, assessment of uh, students in the university. So we uh, are involved in the mostly with pedagogical and technological aspects, while the internal evaluation uh, units runs all uh, the evaluation processes regarding the certification and assessment of our uh, tutors and teaching staff, administrative uh, staff and um, university processes, and uh, the evaluation of the educational material from uh, the perspective of students uh, inside the university. So we all uh, report to our internal quality assurance uh, unit together with the rest of uh, administrative departments and, uh, the, and the schools uh, run um, by the Hellenic Open University. So there are um, different cooperating uh, entities and uh, we partition this work uh, among them. And this was the slide that uh, I would like to uh, share. The rest of them are related to the Ecomet Lab, so I stop sharing. And I would just like to mention that uh, uh, in parallel to the quality label um, that we have uh, received for the nine uh, uh, master programs that uh, George mentioned, we are developing uh, um, quite more programs uh, the last couple of years. So we, sh we are interested to add them also to the uh, accredited um, uh, programs uh, of the quality label. And we have reached uh, a significant amount uh, of uh, um, uh, program, new programs that run on a six monthly semester uh, basis with digital content hosted on the LMS, uh, for which the Ecomet Lab is uh, responsible to implement the process. And uh, this year it was the first year that we also enlisted the process of developing the uh, and uh, the um, digital courses also in our ISO system. So we have added the process of developing material and developing uh, designing courses uh, into our ISO uh, evaluated processes, internal processes. And uh, of course, ISO uh, oversees another aspect of the process and not the academic content of the courses. Uh, but the lab is responsible for the um, uh, evaluation of the content, while ISO um, also uh, accredits this for the maintaining the process and collaboration between the developers of the courses. So this gives a, a, an idea of our internal uh, organization. Yeah, thanks so much. That uh, makes it a lot clearer. Um, and indeed, I think the um, Adding the, the quality label or the discussion or further improvement with the excellence uh, always uh, has an added added value in um, and also with the with the quality agency. I uh, I will send you the paper from the working group of Enqua on how how quality agencies could deal with online education. I don't know if you have that report, but uh, I will I will send it to you so that uh, that should be also in the possession of the Hellenic um, Accreditation Office. But do you do you do you find that this is a recurring issue in other countries as well, or isn't it? You know, uh, trying to 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 align distance teaching and learning with the, what the educational authorities, higher education authorities in these countries are doing, is it, it an issue? It is very much depending on the relationship between the uh, open universities and the quality agencies. Some they are very distant, but some are really really open uh, and and uh, can discuss everything, having a dialogue. 
but some are really they come in tick boxes and uh, well then they do not score that well uh, but this dialogue is really really important and that's why the guidelines from from NQA are so important for these accreditation or these quality agencies yeah. um, to be yeah. followed uh, Josh, I remember uh, during the development of the uh, of the last uh, revision, the last revision of uh, e-excellence, uh, that we had uh, workshops with some quality assurance agencies in Spain, for example, but also others. And perhaps that has been also very helpful that that, uh, that there was a kind of dialogue between the Open University, between uh, the agency, and uh, also. EDTU uh, for uh, setting up uh, a good, uh, uh, really a, a good quality assurance system for business education. So I remember that we had these sessions, and, and in these countries, this has been very helpful, I think, for the acceptance of uh, these uh, uh, quality guidelines, which afterwards were integrated in the ENQA guidelines. I think that's the best uh, uh, vehicle to, um, yeah, to, to connect and, and, and not uh, and not yeah, being ignored on the on the um, on the efforts uh, of quality that uh, our open universities are taking um, to offer quality online education, but that but more often not seen by the Q, uh, QA agencies because they use a system that doesn't fit, uh, and our efforts to to make the, that connection. Um, Worked very well, but then it has to uh, be um, known by the national QA agencies, and that's um, we also prepared to um, to visit the QA agencies and and, and explain. Uh, so we're always open to to have, and, and we often ask that when we have a local seminar on site, and that we uh, bring also a visit to the QA agency to to discuss with them also the, the work of Enqua and the excellence and and how that connects with with our open universities. And they will be more and more interested because uh, online education becomes more uh, um, uh, mainstream in conventional universities as well. So they, they need to adapt uh, not only for the OUs, but for more universities uh, become, um, as it is becoming mainstream. Uh, so they are, should be interested in that. But is the working relationship with the national agency being mostly promoted by ADTU or by the local open university that's uh, I, I'm not sure how the politics go there or the dynamics um, uh, often the connection is already there and um, if not it is a good opportunity when we visit that uh, we take the opportunity uh, to have a combined meeting not a whole, not two days or so but uh, one separate with the university of course but there is a moment of a combination where the QA agency is there and the Open University with us, um, it's, it's an opportunity for, for planning such a meeting if, yeah. uh, if the dialogue isn't there yet. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, the, the, you had an evaluation last week or the week before? Um, do you experience still problems with your QA agency and not understanding uh, it's not really a problem. I, I think Nikos and, uh, ha, had, had quite a, a few interactions with them regarding the standard questionnaire they issue to all universities for assessment. And uh, a lot of it is not uh, well aligned with how uh, we do uh, education. Uh, and uh, it's not because we have a different practice, it's because the university works in a different way. Uh, Nikos, would you want to make a, a couple of points about your discussions with them? Yes, in, in general, uh, with uh, the, the discussion with the uh, uh, agency, the Hellenic agency, is uh, uh, often uh, ab ab about the, um, the difference that we have, and uh, uh, there are many indicators, uh, qualitative indicators, that uh, we are outliers. Uh, comparing with uh, the other traditional universities. And um, in a general uh, uh, point of view, this is not a good, uh, this is not good uh, uh, for our picture in, in, the, in the world. So we are, uh, uh, we are uh, discussing about how, how can we 
uh, we put together the, uh, the particularities of our university and the global indi indicators that uh, the quality assurance agency is, uh, is using. So we have um, actually done it um, by, by defining uh, new indicators, by defining uh, new ways of calculations. Um, uh, let, let's uh, give you an example. We have, uh, we have problems with uh, the meaning of, of, um, of what is a, a, an active student. How can we define the active student in Leon Copen University and in traditional university? For us, active student is a student that has paid for a, for a, a module, a course module. So, so, so there are many, many issues. Uh, however, we are going in a, in, a, in a good way and we have a nice uh, uh, collaboration. And um, actually, there are not uh, there are not um, two two big uh, problems to, to be solved. We are we are now in a, in a nice road. Yeah. Another way forward uh, might be that uh, the quality assurance agency or the accreditation agency, when they come when they visit the university, that they include in their review panel an expert in distance education. Uh, yeah. that, that is what is done in the Netherlands and in Belgium. We have a common accredit accreditation agency, NBAO. And uh, every time that is open online learning, teaching and learning is, is uh, on the table, they make sure that for that program or also for the institutional evaluation, that then uh, uh, an expert in distance education or in an online education is there in the panel. So. Uh, one of the members has the expertise uh, to evaluate. And that's also very helpful, I think, that uh, one of the members of the review panel has that particular scope uh, on distance education, online education, blended education. And perhaps in the future, this is more and more needed, not just for open universities, but also for traditional universities. But it's common practice in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and I suppose also in some other countries. It's also a good approach, I think. Yeah, the, uh, Enkra, uh, uh, actually on, on our uh, yeah. promotion, uh, Enkra uh, indicated also that they need to have a kind of a, um, an inventory, a database of uh, e-learning experts mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that they can uh, connect them to the review panels. Yeah. Should be uh, expert pool, uh, uh, visible European-wide um, so that they can involve them in the, in the reviews. Yeah. Well, I think that's definitely something we should take up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, what we discussed with ANCRA also. Um, I must say, uh, after the working group closed, it, uh, uh, we asked the, the leader of the working group to present at our conferences. Uh, Esther Huertes from Acre Catalunya was the chair. She did that at uh, one or two of our conferences. I remember an Irish, um, uh, she spoke. And I think in our summit. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, the attention of, of uh, Ankara declined a bit on, uh, uh, on that because there was no, no um, uh, uh, ongoing activity in this sense. But uh, the paper is there, the, the, the references are there to do so. And uh, yeah, maybe we can look in 2021 to pick that up. Uh, in our ambition, uh, we want to visit more members in collaboration with QA agencies to meet them together uh, and spread the word of this working group of NCAR also. Yeah. That, that is what we think from European level now going more national level. Okay, I, uh, I think you're realizing the time also that it's almost 12 o'clock and we have one hour left. Um, I think we have to go to the next topic. Uh, these are all <laughs> very interesting topics, but we have covered only two yet uh, uh, of them. I think the micro credentials is also. Um, uh, yes, Marie? Yeah, let me ask something. Uh, do you think it's a good practice to apply for accreditation of uh, study programs individually? Mm. Uh, well, th there's quite a discussion about it. Huh? So, uh, um, 
it's now it becomes more common practice i think in the european quality assurance agencies in the respective european countries uh, that an institutional accreditation is combined with program accreditation and um, um, so i i remember um, in earlier times so not not so long ago uh, then, for example, in the Netherlands and Belgium, it was only program accreditation, individual programs, which were, were accredited by a review panel uh, of uh, the accreditation agency. And that policy is left because it was too time intensive and, uh, and also very, very expensive, actually. And uh, therefore, uh, they combine now the two systems. And so you have at the one hand, uh, and that's the perhaps, uh, yeah, I, I should not say the most important, but uh, um, the, the, the main focus is on institutional accreditation. And, and, and there is uh, not a secondary focus, but uh, every year a sample of, uh, of programs is taken for uh, program accreditation. Uh, and so uh, both are both systems or both approaches are combined. Yeah? And so I think it's not so important to have uh, a program ac accreditation for each of the programs. However, uh, there, there can be uh, some exceptions huh? because sometimes uh, for professional accreditation, uh, it's required that a program has also a, a wider accreditation. For example, uh, typically examples are uh, uh, the programs in business administration, the MBAs, for example, uh, uh, but also in engineering. You have, and uh, yeah, mostly in the, these two cases, you have international accreditation agencies as well, uh, belonging to uh, these networks of, uh, of business administration schools and engineering schools. And in, in these cases, it's important that uh, a program accreditation is done just to facilitate afterwards the, the status and the position of the alumni of these programs, uh, because then often also a professional accreditation is required. So uh, um, in most cases, when, when universities do such a, a wider uh, um, engineering school or business administration school ac accreditation, they are uh, exempted from the national agency accreditation. So they don't need to do both. Um, so yeah, um, perhaps it's, it's, it's um, uh, the best, it best is to find a good balance uh, between institutional accreditation and program accreditation. And, uh, but this balance is in most cases uh, negotiated or uh, discussed at the national level uh, within the accreditation agencies. Yeah, thanks. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to look up the, the paper from the uh, ENQA and I'll put it in the chat. And I think we have, uh, uh, it's now time to go to the topic of, of micro-credentials, uh, for which Pete has prepared some, some slides. Uh, and you can share the screen, I guess, Pete. And so we're gonna have a flow for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'd like to make a short introduction about how we picked that topic. And mainly from my point of view, it's uh, the, uh, as I see it, the wide gap between uh, what seems to be promoted by the European Commission in terms of micro credentials and the recognition of prior learning or expertise, and what some countries, including Greece, do as a practice, which is basically uh, uh, very difficult to, to, to see this kind of activity streamlined into legislation or whatever. So yeah. I'm trying, this is why uh, we picked up this point, this topic, mainly to see, uh, to, to, to understand the gap. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's a good, <laughs> good introductory remark, because that's the, that's the case in many countries, actually. And, and perhaps in most countries, I, I don't know exactly, but uh, certainly in many, many countries. And so uh, let's say the, the discussion about, about micro-credentials is a new discussion in all of the European countries, but it's now uh, taken up in, um, uh, at, a, at a European le level 
after some studies and some projects which are done, and also uh, after, uh, 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 let's say, uh, employers, but also universities felt the need uh, to organize micro-credentials. So we had a seminar last days at the University of Leuven about uh, short learning programs and, uh, and uh, micro-credentials. And there, for example, uh, and that was really, that is really new, some individual professors asked uh, to organize a kind of micro-credential program around their own course, their own subject, perhaps combined with some other courses, really, and that's really forming a micro-credential. And at this moment, the university had not, not a solution uh, for organizing such uh, small uh, programs. So there is not only a demand uh, uh, from the economy, from Europe, but also at the level of the university itself, some professors, and, and in most cases, the most dynamic professors, they feel the need to teach also in smaller units uh, for professionals, uh, because their subject is, is very relevant uh, for uh, for the professionals in their sector and their network. And it can be in, in, in whatever uh, faculty. Uh, so there, that, that's, that's a new dynamics which will be created anyway. And that's what I wanted to do to demonstrate first. Uh, so we have now indeed uh, um, a, a statement of the European Commission in a new document uh, after the, the, the 30th of September uh, uh, 2020, so a few months ago, uh, stating that uh, the Commission is working towards the development of a European approach to micro-credentials uh, and is in the sphere of lifelong learning to widen learning opportunities. And the main role played there is, of course, higher education institutions uh, in the sphere of lifelong learning. And yeah, uh, it's felt that it was needed to, to organize also some smaller units, more flexibly, uh, new learning opportunities for professionals easily to take up as a complement to earlier degrees, uh, that's bachelor, master, uh, doctoral uh, programs. Uh, but it is felt by open universities that it can also be uh, uh, just an introduction or a part of, for example, an, an initial uh, a bachelor program or a, a, a master program, not as a complement, but as an introduction or a, a part, a module in, 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 in the sphere of a bachelor or a master uh, program. Um, so uh, what the commission is going to do now uh, is to prepare a council recommendation by 2021, next year. So, um, so uh, the commission has uh, material enough to, to do so. And um, yeah, a, a council recommendation is of course a documented uh, proposal to the ministers of education of each of the 27 European countries. And by doing so, by having that council recommendation, inevitably uh, this, is, this issue or this proposal for organizing micro-credentials is coming, coming on the table of every ministry in Europe for if the, uh, is coming on the table of every minister and all of the member states. So the discussion will, will, will come next year, uh, also in Greece, also in Belgium, also in the Netherlands, also in Germany, everywhere. And um, where also in, in our countries uh, like Belgium, the Netherlands, this is uh, something where the ministries were un unfamiliar with Nevertheless, it comes on the table and they have to discuss it. They will discuss it. And uh, there is also a ground stream in, in universities and um, also at the employer side, um, responding to the need of, of, uh, of employers uh, to organize this. And uh, well, of course, a council recommendation is not enough. It's just a, a, pre a preparatory, docu preparatory document which will be discussed in, in, in the next years in, in, the, uh, in, in the different, in the, in the respective member states. And yeah, it is expected by that by 2025, then a solution will be there. Huh? Uh, so, and that will be uh, monitored by the, the European Commission in this case. Uh, the content of these micro-credentials, of course, well, I don't know if the Commission has enough competence uh, to define that content. 
And therefore, we have to discuss this all together because, of course, education is a national competence and uh, the Commission should be, it will be very careful not to exceed its or the thresholds of, it comp of, uh, of its competences. If you want a, a, a good overview of the, the current discussion, there is a document which is open to everybody. Uh, so the Belgian Ministry of Education is, uh, the ministry is coordinating uh, uh, a project about uh, micro credentials uh, uh, as it might be integrated as they might be integrated in the European higher education area next to the bachelor, the master and the doctoral degrees. And, uh, um, the micro credentials might be integrated in the structure of the European higher education area. Uh, it's important that this initiative is taken by a ministry. Uh, so in this case, the Flemish ministry. Uh, because all the Bologna follow-up group uh, people, so all the rep all representatives in the Bologna process uh, from the ministries, from all the ministries, the 27 ministries, will be involved in the further development of the concept of micro-credentials uh, in Europe at the European level. Uh, and so uh, we will, we, you will see in this document that also we have played a role of George um, uh, George is member of this. Uh, is, is representing EDTU as a part as a partner in this project, as he is also involved in the working group of the European Commission uh, on micro credentials. And these two groups, the working group of the European Commission and this Bologna group, these are the ministries. This is not a commission. They work in parallel. They work in parallel and complementary. And that's also needed because of the division of competences, sometimes a little bit complex, but now we see that we see a lot of conversions. And uh, when you read this document, you, you, you find really uh, the current discussion in a nutshell, very important. And so also we follow this up very closely. Um, now, um, um, micro-credentials, I, I, I told already, or a new form, a new answer, on the needs of learners in continuous education, as you are aware of well, as well, because as I understood already, you organize also modules or, or, or single courses for, uh, for, for, for students. And so it's very important also for continuous professional uh, development. Um, so first starting with the common micro-credential framework. So our input was mainly uh, this common micro-credential framework. Um, you have understood uh, without doubt that, uh, for example, American uh, uh, MOOC platforms has, have, uh, uh, have organized uh, MOOC-based programs uh, and, and awarding, for example, micro, uh, micro masters or nano degrees or other programs. And so, um, uh, our European MOOC platforms, and we have established as the EDTU uh, with uh, the main European MOOC platforms, the European MOOC Consortium. It consists of uh, FutureLearn uh, Fun, France University in America, Miriada X in Spain, AD Open in Italy, and also our own portal, portal uh, OpenABET is represented there. So we felt the need in, uh, also to develop a micro credential. Uh, but very much linked to the Bologna tools. So it's a very European solution, very European solution to, um, uh, um, to uh, designing uh, micro-credentials and developing micro-credentials as a qualification. Right? Um, so uh, it's, it's not just, a re I wanted to say, it's not just a reaction to the American developments, it's also an own European development because we have a lot of Bologna tools which, which can be very useful uh, for micro credentials as well. And we have integrated or we have linked our uh, micro credential framework uh, with these uh, Bologna tools. Um, I leave for a while this 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 um, uh, this definition because you will find that this again, but. What we wanted with this common micro credential framework becomes very clearly in this slide. So, for us, uh, uh, for the European MOOC Consortium and the universities which are linked to the 
different MOOC platforms. These are the criteria for in which we use in the common micro-credential framework. Um, and the criteria are as follows. So for us, a micro-credential in, in the common micro-credential framework um, consists of a program of two or three courses, for example, online, uh, from four to six ECTS, not more, not less, uh, or 100 to 150 hours of work load. Uh, so that's important and uh, because uh, for different reasons. So one of the reasons is that this is substantial. Of course, this, this program should also be coherent. Huh? It's not just uh, three or four courses in a row. It's, it's a coherent uh, program uh, covering a, a coherent set of uh, competences. And uh, so 100 to 100 hours uh, workload is also corresponding to, well, a substantial effort of a student. Uh, so um, that makes that it's the result of eight hours study in a week during 10, 15 weeks. So that is already substantial. Uh, it's not as substantial, of course, as a bachelor program. Uh, we can later on we can back on this, but this is already substantial, and uh, yeah, it's worth a new kind of award. It's it's worth a new kind of uh, qualification. It's really a qualification, so we have to keep this in mind. So, a, a bachelor degree is a qualification, a master degree is a qualification, and continuing education, we foresee that this is also a qualification we can which can be used as a as also as a kind of modular uh, module in a, in a wider program. So that's the, that's the issue or that's the, 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 the stackability aspect. Moreover, uh, um, it's important that we really um, uh, characterize or link such a micro-credential to, to the European qualification level. It can be level five to eight. Level five is uh, yeah, uh, the short courses as provided in, in the Bologna uh, pro process as well, as provided in the European higher education area. It's, it's just below the bachelor. Six is bachelor, seven is uh, master, eight is the uh, doctoral uh, degree. So um, it's delivering ECTS, which is uh, an academic award at the other end, we indicate every time also for that micro-credential, the level. Uh, it's at least the bachelor level or, at, uh, or sometimes also at the foundation level. For, you know that in some countries, this foundation level is organized by higher education institutions as well and delivering ECTS, that's the condition of course. And then uh, we make sure also that when um, a micro-credential and a common micro-credential framework is issued, that a kind of diploma supplement, in this case, a certificate supplement is provided, it's attached to the, um, to the certificate, to the award, with a specification of the learning outcomes, the mode of delivery, the EQF level, the ECTS uh, uh, credits earned. And of course, um, it, it must be also, certainly when it is online, it, it must be, be uh, uh, sure that um, the, the method uh, for uh, the, the ID verification, we have discussed this already today, in the assessment is a really a reliable verification. So uh, the, the, the micro-credential uh, award must show that this is a reliable um, that there, that there has been a reliable assessment. So these are the characteristics of, the, uh, of a micro-credential as an award, as a qualification, which is issued by a higher, higher education institution. And um, you see immediately that there is a lot of potential in this kind of definition, certainly when you plan to organize uh, programs in a modular structure where this CMF micro-credential can be uh, stackable. Um, so, and then we had, and you are also... Sorry um, for the interruption, and Mr. Vice President is waiting to the lobby for, for coming, for joining the, the meeting. So, uh, um, 
somebody has hello, him, them, uh, Josh? Yeah, yeah, I uh, admitted him. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So uh, that's the, the micro-credential part uh, of the common micro-credential framework part. But we had also another project uh, uh, and that started even before this uh, micro-credential discussion. That was the short learning programs. So in a rector's meeting in Hagen in Germany, or in a general assembly, I don't know anymore, in Hagen it was decided uh, to think about organizing at open universities also short learning programs because it was felt that, organize, that yeah, organizing bachelor degrees and master degrees and doctoral degrees, uh, or certainly bachelor and master degrees uh, for working students, uh, yeah, that, that was uh, a little bit tricky for a lot of students because their time horizon was not that long that they would study uh, six years on a bachelor and then for two years, additional years on a master. So for, for a lot of open university students, this time horizon for degree programs in distance education is too long. It was felt too long. And on top of that, uh, some of the open universities were not funded if uh, students would leave a program earlier. And so when students leave a program after 30 ECTS or uh, even after uh, uh, 60 ECTS and not having a bachelor degree, sometimes in some countries, well, uh, in that case, the OP universities are not funded for this, these students. And so there were several reasons to think about short learning programs. But the main reason was that perhaps it was worthwhile to, to create these short learning programs of, of um, yeah, uh, these short learning programs uh, for uh, meeting the needs of students who wanted really a, a shorter effort than 180 ECTS, like in a bachelor program. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and I, I told already these SLPs would then respond better to the time horizon of learners in continuing education. But at the other hand, they are stackable to a bachelor program, always in the concept of the open universities. And uh, by awarding a qualification or an award after uh, a short learning program, they mot motivate also students to take then an addi additional steps to finally achieve a bachelor program. Um, so that was the idea of the open universities. Um, and well, uh, for the short learning programs, already when we developed that idea further in a project, uh, the ESLP project, we came to the same characteristics actually as for uh, CMF. Also, we, we linked uh, these short learning programs to um, the tools of, uh, to the Bologna tools of, uh, yeah, it must, must uh, be, they must be academic programs. So to deliver ECTS, which was really a very important condition for the OP universities to accept the idea of short learning programs as well. It, was, uh, it should not be simply continuing education without uh, ECTS. Uh, um, that, that was very important. And also the short learning programs should then deliver uh, or attach uh, a diploma supplement or a qualification supplement uh, to uh, the qualification given. So uh, very similar actually uh, to uh, the uh, as a, uh, CMF uh, micro-credentials. Uh, about the size, it was proposed in that project that we consider uh, programs as short learning programs when they have five to 30 ECTS. Uh, and also that they would reach five to eight uh, EQF level. Um, yeah, and therefore, because ECTS are delivered, they are only provided by higher education institutions. Uh, as far as open universities are concerned, they are delivered online or blended, but mostly online. Uh, also stackable to a degree program was also an important uh, characteristics of short learning programs. And the credential should be accompanied by a diploma supplement. Uh, and um, there was no 
ac external accreditation for these short learning programs, only in internal accreditation, because short learning programs should have the possibility to react immediately in a very short time to, to needs in society, in the economy. For example, with regard to digitalization, and there is no way to wait for it for an accreditation, uh, which takes sometimes one or two years in some accreditation system. So internal quality assurance is sufficient. Uh, of course, when they are, they are stackable, when they are part of a bachelor program, they, are, they, they come automatically later on in an accreditation process. So um, when we had these two things, uh, the, the micro-credentials and, micro, uh, and the common micro-credential framework, and on the other hand, we had the short learning programs, which might be wider, uh, we could also think about uh, making CMF modules, uh, uh, CMF qualifications, a module of short learning programs. So, so you can imagine that you develop a short learning programs, which consists uh, of uh, several, two or three, uh, CMF micro-credentials. So everything is modular. And at the end, yeah, perhaps open university in the first place, we have to think about an award structure, a new award structure or a, uh, an adapted award structure uh, of in continuing education. And so slightly we develop a proposal which has to be discussed further and is already discussed in, in the General Assembly to some extent. Um, so when you organize, when you are an open university, but also when you are a traditional university, but okay, the, the mission of open universities is lifelong learning, then perhaps uh, you can imagine that some of your uh, colleagues organize some uh, uh, continuing education courses or learning units or micro learning units of less than one ECTS which are not awarded with an ECTS point, uh, which are just awarded with uh, a certificate of uh, attendance or something like that. And so there, there are not so many regulations for this. And also, we don't, I don't think we need very many regulations, only at the faculty level, perhaps. And then we come at a, at a, at a single course, at that level of a single course. And there, of course, with a single course, or a single MOOC with credits. Uh, some MOOCs have EC, uh, deliver ECTS credits. Uh, then for such a single course, you deliver one or three ECTS points, but it's not enough to deliver a qualification. Uh, so like uh, the following step, a CMF micro-credential program is really a qualification covering a coherent uh, covering a coherent set of competences in a, in a kind of in a in a subject area in a particular subject. So we think a single course, and that's also the reality in, in, in some of our systems at the OP universities, are just awarded with a credit. The, you get always credits for a formal course and uh, for a set for a program uh, of four to six ECTS points, you get a real qualification which is a micro-credential. So, and the next step is then broader certified uh, programs. And in all of our, of our open universities, we find a lot of these programs with different names, different awards, like at the open universities, they have undergraduate certificates, postgraduate certificates. In Spain, they have certificates of specialization, certificate of expert. In the Netherlands, you have a certified professional program. You have also focused diplomas. Uh, in all universities in Europe, you have micro masters and, and other uh, uh, qualifications as well. And uh, these programs have normally a study load of 20 to 40 ECTS with an average, let's say, of 30 ECTS. And actually, uh, in our definition of short learning programs, uh, these CMF micro-credentials and also the certified uh, programs are considered. Uh, but you have two types of qualification, perhaps, which are important for the structure of continuing education in open universities and also in other universities. All these uh, steps are stackable. Uh, and finally, also stackable to 
a degree program. It's not always the case, of course, but uh, they might be stackable or universities might organize uh, their uh, educational program or continue education program in such a way that they are stackable. So the final uh, step is then a degree program, a bachelor, a master, or, or a, a doctoral degree, which takes, of course, 180 ECTS. And for master programs and doctoral programs, it's also 60 uh, to 120 CS or CTS or 240, 180 for doctoral programs. So that might be the, uh, the a new award structure in continuing education. Uh, which uh, can uh, inspire uh, universities to to better structure uh, on the continuing education programs and, and also which might help uh, universities to think about um, the qualifications they want to deliver in, in continuing education. Uh, I must say that in the seminars we had in the framework of that SLP project, um, the three universities where we had these seminars were very, uh, uh, found this scheme were very, very uh, helpful and, uh, but not always easy because as you said as well, um, at this moment, uh, for example, the micro-credentials are not there. And there are a lot of uh, um, programs are organized uh, while they are not so much structured in, in such a way, and this causes also a lot of discussions, internal discussions, and uh, uh, um, and issues at the level of faculties and also at institutional level. So that's what we propose, and we think that uh, that uh, when you have such a framework, that learners uh, find recognition for even smaller steps in continuing education by awarding a real qualification after the successful com completion, not just of a bachelor or a certificate program, but also a, a micro-credential, um, that learners are triggered to, to start additional learning paths uh, towards a next milestone uh, throughout their lives, step by step, and they get a qualification, that's a reward, and then they have immediately an, a new horizon for eventually a new additional learning path. Um, a maximum of flexibility is offered in combining learning with the workplace is also very important uh, because uh, so long, long programs are, is, is sometimes very difficult to combine such a long time uh, in combination with, with work or family. And, but uh, a very important aspect, of course, is that uh, this qualification, and that's also what the commission is envisaging, and which is on the table of the ministries, uh, these qualifications will be standardized and therefore also endorsed across universities and also by employers. That's also, that's also very important. So this is a very quick and short introduction and I don't know is it, if it is helpful for you to think about uh, the structure of continuing education at, at your university. Thank you very much, Pete, for the, uh, for the introduction. In the meantime, I would like to welcome also the Vice President that joined uh, the meeting just now. Um, maybe uh, Mr. Stakis. Abstratopoulos would like to introduce um, some shortly. Uh, hello, everybody. Actually, uh, I haven't any slides to uh, to show. I just uh, would like to uh, to congratulate for this uh, seminar uh, for this uh, uh, for the lectures and for the uh, whole event uh, that which uh, uh, advances our experiences and uh, uh, work to to this especially into this uh, situation I have to congratulate uh, Dimitris Kales and uh, all the other uh, 
professors from our university that uh, uh, made the arrangements for uh, this event and uh, wish good uh, uh, good continuation of the event. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. We were very pleased that it was actually at such short notice we were able to um, make. Um, and also, also to thank you very much for uh, for your participation and uh, presentations and uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, we were um, looking into the topic of the of the market credentials, which uh, Itamlik just introduced. Uh, any first uh, reflections? Maybe uh, Dimitris is this in. Yes, I, I, I have something to start to get the discussion going. One of the things that has been bothering me for quite some time, because I've been following that through ADDU, is that uh, we normally find it difficult enough huh, to, uh, uh, to accept uh, a student, uh, let's say, in a conventional or in a distance learning university, who is interested in... Uh, showing us credentials that they have completed some part of their studies in a previous university. So the ECTS system is well established, but still universities have quite some difficulty in uh, uh, accepting students who have done part of their degrees at a different university. So I understand that with micro-credentials, things are going to go that way too, and it's going to be pretty difficult. So I'm wondering who is the consumer of uh, the micro-credentials and the SLPs right now? Is it the industry? Is it the universities that allow for better mobilization or mobility of students? I'm not quite sure who is the primary consumer of this scheme. Mm. Well, I, I think that the primary consumer is the student, is the learner, huh? because he has the opportunity to follow uh, um, very uh, smaller units, which are nevertheless as stackable to larger units of study. And, and so that will motivate students uh, to take up also, uh, uh, to take up smaller pieces uh, um, of, of uh, programs, of learning programs, instead of going immediately as an adult uh, into a, a, bachelor de a bachelor degree uh, program. It's a step-by-step it's a -step approach to, uh, to lifelong learning. And uh, we expect that students, uh, that more students, uh, will in this in this way, um, will uh, uh, will be will register for uh, higher education programs also at at, at open universities. Um, so that, that's one thing. Um, but also from the employer side, there is a clear demand uh, for additional. Um, uh, continue education, for example, with regard to new areas uh, in, uh, linked to digitalization or, or, or manufacturing and, and uh, uh, climate, climate change and, and, uh, and the incidents on, on production processes and so on and so on. There are a lot of areas also in business administration, business studies. Um, um, and so uh, we see that the participation uh, rate of um, adults in in higher in, in lifelong learning in general in Europe is is really very low in some countries also for example in my own country is it's much higher in the Netherlands but there is an issue of um, of, uh, uh, of of uh, lifelong learning higher education also at the level of higher education uh, in uh, European countries. Uh, the qualification level of uh, the European workforce is uh, too low, uh, and, and that's a challenge uh, which concerns uh, uh, individual learners, uh, the industry or, or, or businesses, the business sector, uh, and also universities. And of course, universities find it difficult uh, to respond immediately to those, to, to those needs. And perhaps, perhaps these new schemes of micro credentials and uh, and uh, and uh, short learning programs helps them to meet uh, these needs and to organize these programs in a, in a coherent uh, way and to develop an institutional policy. Of course, installing this new qualification in itself will not is not enough. Uh, universities 
but that's not the case for open universities, have also to organize new uh, structures uh, within the institutions, for example, extension schools, like this, well, like this the case in, in, in many uh, countries in the United States, but also in the UK, for example, uh, where they really take up this function of uh, continuing education. Open universities in most cases do that already. So, uh, well, I think the primary uh, client or the, or the learners, of course, but also the employers who are requesting uh, smaller units of learning, uh, developing uh, competences, very, very, very uh, mm, uh, clear competences in some areas, just uh, to uh, qualify better uh, the, the, the workforce and they have an employment. I think the, the, uh, uh, the CMF will support the business model to gain attraction from students, also to immediately uh, choose for a CMF awarded um, uh, credential short program, because it's so much more recognizable um, uh, for the employers also to see what the value is. And uh, it is much more a qualification than a certificate or a badge. So, uh, uh, newcomers on the CMF will have also very much more prominent uh, exposure as we list the CMF awarded uh, short programs in a, in a separate uh, portal. And um, uh, in all, it, this should be an incentive for our universities to develop programs in line with the framework of the Common Micro Credential Framework uh, and get more, more attraction by students also to follow them. Uh, we see the development now uh, uh, going on on micro credentials, uh, for example, in uh, IT, uh, mic micro credentials, and later on micro degrees, and then which fit also in some bachelors, for example, also in teacher training. So there are concrete examples, and in healthcare. So it's very much needed in these times. And so we see that so this this new qualification structure for continuing education, so for for adult learners at work, uh, that they are very important to meet actual needs in society. And so it's important for the learners, it's important also for the employers in these sectors, uh, in the IT sector or in companies, businesses, uh, which need uh, digitalization and teacher training for sure as well. There's a shortage of teachers in many, many countries in Europe and, uh, and certainly in healthcare. Uh, these are th three specific areas, but next developments we see also in, in, in business studies, for example. Uh, I, I understand this point of view pretty clearly. Uh, it's just that I think that my the, the concern for me, for at least, uh, is that uh, if, uh, let's say, a university uh, administers a micro degree or uh, something that's a, a short learning program, let's say at an undergraduate level, uh, right now there is no clear regulatory path, path for this person to be admitted to a degree, no. to a bachelor degree. They have to start afresh. Now, no. so, so basically if universities do that, they undermine their main line of business, which is to get students out with a degree. So unless this stackability that you are describing is actually uh, you know, pretty standard from a regulatory point of view, I don't think that the universities will be tempted to do that, at least to a, say, to a scale that would be useful for a lot of students. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they, they are reluctant to do that at, uh, for mainstream bachelor programs, huh? but in continuing education is a completely different case. Huh? So uh, I think this is really specific, specifically applicable to continue education, not so much in mainstream education. That's what I, I personally uh, think about this. And uh, of course, uh, universities will be reluctant in, uh, to do that when, uh, uh, when this means uh, uh, that this undermines their degrees. Uh, universities want in the first place to deliver degrees. Also open universities want to do that. But on the other hand, uh, there are needs in society which needs to be met immediately. 
in a very short time and and and, and in a scalable way as well and there the open universities can take a front rather role in continuing education and uh, so uh, actually uh, the advantage uh, the comparative advantage uh, for open universities is that they can organize this online very flexibly and scalable uh, all over the country, all over the region. And uh, I don't expect that traditional universities are, are going to, this, to do this online. They are going to do the same with the same qualification structure. And uh, anyway, this will also be promoted by the European Commission. Uh, but the, the, the big part of continuing education in traditional universities in the first years, I expect uh, that they will remain face-to-face -face, uh, provisions, so not scalable. And, uh, and this is uh, where uh, open universities can, can develop their own policies, very scalable uh, provisions uh, with, a, with a time horizon that fits uh, the, the life conditions of uh, adult students. So that's uh, that's uh, what open universities can do, and in that sense, it's very attractive to do so. Actually, um, the movement comes from from two sides. Actually, the, the movement comes from MOOC platforms uh, that want just to develop from the, the the delivery of single books to MOOC programs, and therefore needed a new qualification level, which is a, a, a micro credential. On the other hand, the movement is also coming from the open universities, uh, which found out that um, yeah, um, just delivering bachelor programs or master programs was not corresponding with the time horizon uh, of, of students, the availability of time uh, for of, of, um, adult students at work. So that's these are the two movements which created the need to think about uh, uh, in between qualifications or new qualifications fitting to the labor market. And this is what is happening now. And so, um, and therefore uh, the micro-credentials uh, pop up in, in, in all of the discussions now. And uh, short learning programs are already there. In fact, uh, that these are all these postgraduate, undergraduate certificates and professional uh, continuous education programs, which already exist. Um, so that's not new, new as a provision, but we should also consider this as uh, a valuable uh, qualification. If I may add to this uh, discussion and what uh, Dimitris was uh, mentioning, um, we are ex at the Hellenic Open University, we are experiencing with the short learning programs already for uh, three years now. And I think we were the first uh, university in Greece that uh, introduced the uh, short learning programs. Uh, the questions that uh, arise have to do with the um, uh, recognition of uh, the uh, and um, what you were discussing previously is that it is clear that um, in uh, the professional paths, uh, the, the market will um, uh, recognize uh, the, any kind of course accordingly. Uh, but what uh, Dimitris is, is uh, maybe uh, asking is that from an academic point of view, it is difficult to classify because we are not all have a standardized way uh, to treat um, such kind of micro-credentials. And um, also in the university, we have um, uh, an administrative issue of who handles the short learning programs because it is something between, as you mentioned, uh, lifelong learning activities, uh, uh, vocational training activities, and um, uh, educational programs that were uh, carried out outside the academic context of a school, treated uh, with uh, standard processes that we develop courses for undergraduate and postgraduate courses, the way we are used to, to do that for many years, and the system has adapted to that. Uh, but now we have to deal with uh, new kinds uh, of uh, education that need to be formally um, uh, offered through appropriate uh, processes, uh, more or less. So um, 
the accreditation uh, is important to have um, the classification is important because um, as Dimitris mentioned if we want to accept a student entering a program and wants to uh, recognize one of the previously uh, followed courses outside the university, then we need a formal way to accept this um, uh, certificate that he provides to us in order to uh, consider that these uh, learning um, objectives have been met already in the past. And there is no uh, standard and official way to, um, to evaluate this, let's say, because uh, uh, micro credentials are not uh, officially recognized, especially in higher education. So, how to uh, formalize and uh, make a standard way of uh, introducing this is, again, is still an open uh, issue. And there are also technical uh, issues uh, towards that, and it is, this is related also to the to the next point in the agenda. Uh, because uh, certificates are going digital uh, the last years. So we see a movement of uh, providing digital certificates, introducing them in digital formats. And this makes uh, things even more harder because the classification must be very strict. So as uh, automatic systems understand them and uh, process them. Yeah, you're right. Uh, actually, uh, so for for it, it's 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 new and it's it's not there are no standard uh, ways, but you have you have seen that we define micro credentials and also the CMF systems system in terms of ECTS. So ECTS must be delivered, and that means yeah, ECTS or recognized. These are standard uh, 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 awards. Uh, credits or standard awards which are which can be recognized by a university uh, a micro credential in, in our so we are always thinking in the framework of a formal system uh, so our thinking about cmf and about short learning programs is always in a formal education context uh, uh, it's, it's 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 courses and programs which deliver ects and therefore the recognition of these programs and this new qualification by uh, a, by uh, a university, that recognition is not different from the normal standard procedures of recognition of an ECTS awarded course. So it's that's that's not different. The diff there can be a difference with uh, when a student has also in his digital portfolio, for example. Uh, courses which are uh, non-formal learning or, or past experience and so on. And then you have procedures, of course, after recognition of prior learning. Uh, that's that these are these procedures are quite quite different, and we we will talk about that as well. But as far as these schemes of common micro credential framework and uh, and uh, short learning programs are concerned, yeah, the same rules are followed or uh, or let's say it in another way, uh, universities can can uh, follow the same recognition rules as they follow with normal ECTS awarded courses. Uh, uh, when and yeah, so and I I, I know also that there are some uh, restrictions, some limitations. So you can have a short learning program of thirty ECTS. Yeah, it's stackable, but I can imagine when you have such uh, a, a short learning program in a new new law or something like that, uh, new rights uh, concerning uh, IT technologies, like we know such a program, uh, it cannot be entirely entirely uh, stackable, uh, stackable for a law program, for example, because the size of this short learning program is too big to integrate it as a whole in a, a, a master of law program. So there are always issues. And finally, uh, as now is also the case, it's the university concerned who has to recognize uh, a program. That, that's it's not an automatic recognition. It's that's also not the case with currently uh, with with uh, 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 in universities when when you 
when you have to admit a student, you you look first to the to its uh, uh, portfolio or the courses he is bringing in, and credits are well or not automatically recognized. You look. There's always a kind of a credential evaluation. Of course, this is this is facilitated uh, when ECTS are there and you know the university and so on. Uh, then it's it's easy for a faculty to to uh, to recognize this. Um, uh, when it comes from another from 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 outside of Europe, then you need really a thorough uh, credential evaluation already. But in this case, it's not different uh, from. Um, uh, the, the standard way in, in which you recognize at the university level uh, normally credit awarded uh, courses. Mm, it's even uh, clearer to recognize them because the uh, learning outcomes are clearly defined with the C CMF. Eh? So it, it makes it easier also uh, to, to recognize them. Um, with the CMF, we, we put a kind of a layer of a, of a qualification above the uh, the ECTS, which is an uh, integral part of it, the uh, making it a qualification uh, recognizable by by learning outcomes that are described uh, as well as the link with the European qualification framework, makes it very clear what the um, the added value of this um, micro credential is of this uh, short program. Uh, the endorsement is important then that uh, by the European MOOC consortium that ED2 is representing as well as the institutions under EDTU as member, the endorsement of, of the CMF, the Common Micro Credential Framework, uh, means already that uh, 400 higher education institutions are linked to that, to EMC and EDTU together. We have 400 higher education institutions linked that will be aware of the existence of the qualification of, of CMF and, and endorse it. That is uh, quite substantial and makes it, um, yeah, that makes the the, uh, the, the value um, of these CMF awarded programs much more uh, visible and recognizable. Um, we, and next to that, we, we try to connect also with Europass with the European Commission's um, registration of qualifications um, uh, on, on the Europass. But that, that is a, in parallel, we are connecting there with the European Commission. But it will be much clearer than any other certificate or badge that is out there representing the, the continuing education uh, market. Yeah. Well, uh, the problem you, you, you have raised is, is a problem for all of the universities, actually. Uh, we, we had a seminar this week at the KU Leuven, at the University of Leuven. And there we see also that the current structure of their continue, uh, continuing education, uh, education uh, is not uh, fitting with this micro-credential idea and with this uh, with this uh, short learning program idea, but at the other hand, they say, okay, our structure is not functional enough for continuing education these days. We have to rethink our continuing education structure. And uh, they decided actually to, to rethink the whole structure they have now in terms of micro credentials, short learning programs, and, and, um, and to be ready uh, to propose to their government a structure. Uh, for, uh, yeah, in this case of, uh, of the Flemish part of Belgium, uh, because uh, at the end, it's the Ministry of Education who has the, the, to define the national structure for continuing education, making use of micro-credentials and uh, short learning programs to, to, to define to, to, uh, to, yeah, to define the structure, a national structure for uh, uh, continuing education. So that will be on the table of um, the old ministries of education in the next years. And so the more uh, you reflect, and, and that was also uh, what, what the message of KOL was to us, the more that there is institutional reflection on this, the easier it will be to find a structure, a national structure, which, is, uh, which fits to the, to the needs uh, of um, a country in terms of uh, qualifications of workforce, continuing education, lifelong learning, continuous professional development, and the needs of the, the economy as well. Pete, I think you just hit the nail on the head by saying how the ministries have to be involved because I, you know, I've been, you know, trying to think of a way and I can't figure out how on earth a Greek university could do that 
without asking the ministry to somehow rewrite the law on the stackability of uh, this kind of credentials into degrees. Yeah. So I think it's a very top level thing that has to be settled first before uh, action comes flowing in. Yeah, that's true. But the, the other way, it's very important that at bottom up <laughs> that the university thinks about how can we structure uh, in an optimal way our continuing education provisions and uh, so that uh, <laughs> This can influence the, the institutional, the, the governmental policy. So, actually, governmental policy is all is and, and hopefully also a result of institutional developments which come bottom up. And so now it's time for institutions also to think or rethink uh, their provisions and continue education, uh, not so much in degree structures and so on, but in continue education. Um, to end up with uh, a national system uh, which fits really their needs. So when it, when, it, when it remains really top down and the ministers come with a proposal which doesn't fit the needs of institutions, then we have a real problem. It's better to develop or to think about a, a, a system which would fit you also as an open university and to do proposals to the ministry uh, in terms of micro-credentials and, and to, qualifications for continuing education. And, and that's, that's, that's really the movement we need. We need now a new dynamics coming from the institutions rather than top down. We can look how, how that functions in other uh, countries and uh, um, what is in place to make it, to make it possible, eh? to make a, um, a solid recommendation to the to ministerial level. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's, and these recommendations have to come from the institutions uh, in, a, in a country, uh, really. Uh, so that, that's, that's how it should work. Uh, so uh, it, it's, if not, it's, it's a top-down operation indeed. And if this doesn't, this doesn't fit the universities, it will not have an optimal use. Do you have any successful example of a university, let's say, uh, effectively lobbying its way up to the ministry as to how to create this stackability of this uh, qualification towards a degree. Uh, Is there any example of that? Yeah. No, but, but, but we, see, uh, fair, we see that this, these ideas are, 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 are now developed uh, from different sides, from really different sides. Um, uh, it's, it, uh, yeah. Uh, at the other, and, and these ideas are picked up by the European Commission mainly, uh, because the European Commission, nevertheless, uh, is overviewing uh, the whole continent, let's say, in terms of uh, qualifications of workforce, continued education, and so on. In that area, they are rather strong in, in, uh, in, uh, in their reflections. Um, and at the other hand, we see at, at the university level that the whole, that except for the open universities, that the area of continuing education is not well developed and they have quite different systems uh, which are not really very effective for, for developing uh, the workforce in a country. And they, they are challenged to develop their continuing education systems and they are aware that they have to do that. But uh, that, that's, what, that's the situation in most traditional universities. They are aware that they have to do something but they don't have the instruments and not the, the, the ideas to build it up. And, um, and now the commission is coming with the idea of the micro-credentials and new qualification framework for continuing education and to make it happen and also to make it really a valid solution at the national levels. Uh, and also in a European context, universities have to reflect first about what, how can this be installed? And uh, we see in, in many universities that these ideas are now, um, uh, that, that, that this thinking, these reflections are, 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 are coming up. Uh, for example, at the University of Delft, which is a technical university, they are thinking already a long time about the organization of continuing education. And they say simply, okay, uh, uh, for, for the mainstream, we have blended education for, for uh, uh, continue education, it should be online, flexible, scalable, and so on. So they have some conditions they want to fulfill, and they are uh, really very active in the MOOC movement. And so they are developing micromasters and so on and so on. So, so 
they are uh, in practice they are developing already micro credentials and um, uh, and uh, well they are developing a, a coherent structure uh, already which can be inspiring for other universities and which have, are influencing also European policies and national policies. And I see also in the Netherlands then the University of Wageningen uh, following them. I see now also uh, some meetings between rectors of Wageningen, uh, uh, Delft and, and Leuven, for example, to think together about this. And, and so you see that, that, that slowly or slowly, not, not so slowly, that uh, gradually, um, uh, yeah, new uh, coherent structures for continuing education are built huh? because micromasters are not only organized by Delft, but also by Leuven and by many other universities already. Huh? And, uh, and, and yeah, first needs to be uh, on the agenda. Oh, Ik heb geen afspraken gevonden over between rector 7 Wageningen, Delft en in Leuven van example the tank together about this and Enzo Gossé. It's uh, Siri uh, was activated. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no appointments with Wageningen and Delft, it says. Uh, um, yeah, so you see it has to come on the agenda of both political agenda as institutional agenda. Yeah. And then uh, EDTU is organizing also these peer learning activities. We have in February one peer learning activity on, on uh, uh, recognition of prior learning and one on the European New Consortium for the Labour Market, in which we um, address also the, the micro credentials. Uh, and in this peer learning activity, we invite all stakeholders. That means also the higher education umbrella organizations, universities, but also uh, companies, um, uh, uh, government representatives. Uh, as well as the um, um, these um, exchange uh, agencies uh, of NUFIC in the Netherlands or DRD in Germany, all those are involved also in these um, recognition issues. Uh, it's very important for the open universities to develop a joint thinking and joint dynamics because they are, they are almost, almost all, all in the same situation. They are, they are unique organization, unique selling points for continued education in each of their countries. And so this should be an EDTU discussion at director's level. We have rector's meeting and it, it is on the agenda of director's meeting of EDTU as well. It's a kind of joint dynamics perhaps which should be developed by all the uni open universities together, inspiring each other uh, with, with solutions, new structures, uh, uh, well, uh, thinking about these qualifications, how, how they play a role uh, in the structure of, in the new structure of continuing education in each of their institutions. Okay. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, we could talk a lot about this, but I think well, we are not going to manage the other... No, no, no. <laughs> the agenda, I'm afraid. Oh, are you okay? It's at two o'clock, uh, we have only five minutes left. Um, so we have to... I need to leave in five minutes. <laughs> I, I think we bundled the discussion in one. I mean, you know, it's uh, credentials and recognition are uh, intertwined. That's why we we picked them uh, as a single point anyway. So yeah. I think we are more or less done. Yeah, that is sure. just one, one sentence in addition. Uh, so we have also a, a peer learning activity, I believe, on the recognition of non-formal and informal learning. That's the other side. So we are now discussing the formal learning. We have discussed the formal learning and the recognition of formal learning, the qualification structure for formal continuing education. Uh, talking about non-formal and informal is a different case. Uh, that's the recognition of prior learning for which uh, yeah, uh, the, Europe, the, Europe, the ECTS guide provides some very, very good uh, procedures which are not adopted uh, by all of the European universities, but by most of them. And perhaps you have also your own procedures for the recognition of uh, non-formal, informal learning. And therefore we have also uh, a peer learning activity, I believe, for uh, the recognition of this kind of uh, uh, qualification of learning. Uh, it's not formal, it's not qualification based, it's not ECTS based, but yeah, they are both. Uh, so we have a, a recognition prior learning, peer learning activity. I think it's beginning of March. We have not set the date for that one yet. And we have a meeting on a peer learning meeting on European New Consortium for the Labour Market on micro credentials and adoption of micro credentials also and, and endorsement. 
uh, that will be um, second half of uh, February. We will announce the, both of them in uh, in uh, January. Yeah, so you can take part. It's online. Uh, so uh, all our members will be invited to to join the discussion, and we have also have some interactive breakout sessions. And so so there'll be uh, interesting follow up on this actually, uh, and discuss it with other universities as well. Yeah. Okay, I think that uh, covers it for, for this morning. We, we could have talked the whole afternoon <laughs> on more topics. We skipped the virtual mobility and, and other topics uh, from the selection list. A lot, a lot is going on and it's, uh, it's really the, the momentum also for the open universities to show their leadership and, um, and take also uh, the next steps in, in these, uh, these topics. Also in connection with other stakeholders at the political level and the QA agencies as we uh, discussed uh, earlier. So I, I was really happy that we could make this uh, local seminar um, happen, take place at such short notice. Uh, really enjoyed the, the discussions and also got input for our, for our papers uh, on this. And we, we tried to, to share as most as possible from our policy papers and slides. Um, we will send them to you, to you, Dimitris. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, we, we, you can always ask us further questions in the, in the coming weeks, of course, if there was something uh, not clarified at this at this moment. I'd also like to, to thank you for uh, in, you know for popping up with the idea of this seminar, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues who uh, responded in time for uh, picking up the topics. And I'm looking forward to repeating that again next year, perhaps. Yeah, sure. We'll see. Thank sure. you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.